Hi everyone, and welcome to Deep Dive, a show in which Louisa and I discuss in-depth films that we don't normally get the opportunity to discuss on our video essays. Now, this is a show that's been going for a while on our Patreon, but we've decided to make it public and open here on the channel because we've wanted to expand the cinema cartography for a while, and by doing that, we wanted to bring more programming. The whole basis of this project has always been to improve a discourse on the things that we care about. Now, for all those wondering, yes, the video essays are going to continue, and they're going to continue at the same rate that they always have done. We still do not take sponsorships, and we are both independent, so if you would like to support this project and everything that we're doing, please go on over to the Patreon at patreon.com slash cinemacartography. Over there you can find our exclusive podcast, As It Is Bad For Business, as well as masterclasses, essays, everything that we've done. So thank you all for your support and we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Deep Dive, a show devoted to exploring cinema's masterpieces. Today's film is David Lynch's haunting plunge into the American subconscious, Blue Velvet. The film follows Jeffrey, who upon the discovery of a severed ear, finds himself pulled into the hidden underbelly of his small town of Lumberton, where at night time, the monsters of the world make themselves known. His gateway into this world is the apartment of nightclub singer Dorothy Valens, whose warped sexuality lures Jeffrey in. But upon continuing to venture into her quarters, do we learn that the ruler of this domain is the mysterious boss of the underworld, Frank, who's beginning to transform Jeffrey into something unnatural. Well, we've watched the film, I think, two or three times together. I've seen the film probably around two or three times outside of that as well. And it's a Lynch film. And so I know that Lynch always says that you're not really supposed to explain his films. I don't think that we're going to explain it, but I think like any piece of art, you've got to go into it and try to not necessarily interpret, but find the things that you find that are there for you. And I think with all of his films, even more than a razor head, Blue Velvet is a film that's specifically about a very specific aspect of human psychology and human darkness, which I think is probably going to be, going to be the thing that we're more inclined to speak about than anything else. We'll get onto everything. We'll get onto the filmmaking, we'll get onto Lynch and everything. But the crux of this film is about, I'm going to assume that you're going to say the same thing as me, is about the, the Jungian darkness within mainstream Americana, but specifically how that relates to the psychosexual aspect of a human being. It's also a coming of age story. Go, go on. No, no, I'm not going to. No, go no, take it. No, go I'm on. not going to go, go off on one. Go, go. I also see it as a coming of age story. I do as well. Yeah? Yeah. Good. So yeah, we can discuss well. that. It'll be fun. Six, seven, eight, Keep going. Watching it again now for probably like fifth or sixth time was the first time that I ever really felt that overwhelming sense from Frank's character. I, 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 there's obviously comedic aspects in it. There's obviously very intense and dark aspects of it. But watching it after I, after I know the film by heart, for some reason, it was the first time that, again, I actually felt that aspect of a real strong... I don't know how to explain it, but something... I wanted to reject what was going on. And I never had that with this film, and I don't really have that with films in general. Interesting, because... It's not that I felt the opposite way around, but I remember the first time I watched it, it really had a mad impact on me. I can think of like two films that made me cry after watching, but a different type of cry. Like, cause I cry a lot in films, but one is Eyes Wide Shut by Kubrick and the other one is this film. And it's like this weird realization of like the dark corners of sexuality, I think. But now I felt more relaxed watching the film. I, I enjoyed the experience more. Not that I didn't enjoy it. I always loved this film. But I was able, it clicked more with me in a deeper way. And I guess, I mean, that's probably the 10th time I watched this film. I don't even know. Yeah. Like I watched this film many, many times. And I always flip flop between if this is my favorite Lynch film or I also really like Holland Drive. And I also think Inland Empire is very, very underrated. 
So I keep flip flopping between them, but it's is the is one of those is one of those situations that I could pick the film that I just watched as my favorite. Yeah, you yeah. know, like this is my favorite now because I just watched as my favorite Lynch film. Yeah, Lynch definitely has that. What are you looking at? Nothing. Don't you look at me, fuck! What's this film about then? The way I approach Lynch's work is how I approach a lot of perhaps surrealism or even symbolism in terms of paintings as well. And it's this idea that I'm not concerned about what the film means, but whether how it means, like the the symbolic map that is building for, for you as the viewer. Because you you could say, okay, this film is an analysis of the, the Oedipal complex, okay? You can say it's a completely total Freudian analysis of like the coming of age of a boy coming to his sexuality. You can say it's about violence in America. You can say like there's so many things that you can fit into this film. But I think the most interesting aspect is the debate between how the film is showing those things. I, I found that watching the film again, when you think of Blue Velvet, you think of Frank in particular. And I think that his, the, the intensity of his darkness, which completely overshadows everything in the film. But watching it again, it was the first time I really felt as though there's two sides of the story. There's the side of Jeffrey and there's the side of Frank. And the film opens and we see the blue velvet and we see the white picket fences. We see the very Lynchian, the aggressive nicety of Americana in which he literally has a, a, a fireman driving past and waving at the camera that everything is too perfect. You have this aspect of it and then you have Frank's aspect of it, which is everything that is underground. Like when when we see the man, the, uh, Jeffrey's dad, have a heart attack, we just start to literally sink underground and we see the beetles and everything crawling under. Everything that we're seeing is a veneer and we're going to crawl into the underbelly. I, I know what you mean by the coming of age story because Jeffrey... The whole arc of his story is that he is a naive young man that hasn't necessarily experienced that grit of life because he is trapped in this perfect suburbia and he's been exposed to the darkness and he keeps, he can't stop himself from going to it, whether it's constantly visiting Dorothy. And he mentions this idea of, you know, it's like there's a secret that's always been there and I'm finally discovering it. And he doesn't know exactly what it is. And, and when we're watching it, it's like Lynch. We don't exactly know what it is, but we can recognize that it's within the darkness, within the shadow. But for the first time watching the film again, it wasn't Frank's aspect of the film that I just naturally focused more on. It was Jeffrey's side. And I realize now watching the film that this is more than anything probably Lynch's affirmation towards the idea of light overcoming the shadow. The way that he structures this film in particular, watching it again, you realize how much time is devoted toward Jeffrey's stories and Lorna Dern's character and how in many ways they're very, very naive, but it's such a romantic view of the world that they have. And, you know, when the film starts, it's very B-movie, they're, they're, they're their dialogue is so cheesy and corny and not really attached to anything. It's kind of very up in the air and very ethereal the way they speak. But I also think that it's a very sincere way of, if we're willing to accept Lynch's nightmarish view of the world, he's also, I feel, proposing this very dreamlike, almost utopian view of the world where it's just love and innocence that prevails. As strange as it may be, it's still there. It definitely feels a bit like a pastiche. It feels like a pastiche of what good and bad is as well, and oftentimes in the film. Yeah. Everything is very heightened, like the qualities of everything is times 100, right? You have Sandy, which is this character that the first time we see her, you have this scene of her coming from do complete darkness to light. We can't really pinpoint which decade she's, she belongs to because you have the makeup of Dorothy, which is kind of like 80s, but it's also been 1930s. You have this um, 
very 1970s way of dressing. You have the the hair that is again from could be from the 90s even. You've got the you, 1950s cars that everyone drives. Exactly, you have the the 1950s hairstyle in Jeffrey and all that. So it feels like a pastiche of almost like iconic elements of pop culture in America, yeah. right? So you have all those things playing together in one space. But more than that, I don't know. I feel like I also felt that about Jeffrey being the central more to me now the central aspect and i think it is because the first thing we know is that jeffrey's dad has an accident that's the first it's not explained why it's not explained why it's the first first thing we see interesting because jacques lacan he had this concept for you to really traverse the oedipus complex into your maturity your father at some point has to step down from your in some way. So Lynch sets the sets the the plane perfectly for that. The father steps down. And then the next two male figures that Jeffrey's gonna encounter are almost two polar opposites of each other. You have Sandy's father, which is essentially moral order, signifying in some way morality. And then you have this hyper symbolic, hyper id, hyper pleasure and complete impulsive world which is Frank. And then you have these two male figures almost almost representing also what Jeffrey is experiencing within himself. Then they keep pushing him in terms of the polarity. So I don't think necessarily that Lynch is completely saying that love prevails or that hope prevails or that goodness is going to prevail, but that we have both sides and then they are going to coexist. It's almost like... um. That's why I think it's a coming of age, like mixing Jacques Lacan, mixing Jung and mixing Freud. You have this character that is growing, either figuring out how to integrate his shadow. Mm. You ever been to pussy heaven? No. What did he say? No, no. I hadn't been to pussy heaven. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's, it's funny that you say that because it's still a very Lynchian approach with how he approaches those characters. Because for instance, Sandy's father, he approaches it, the way that he writes his dialogue, he is more of a Lynchian character than I feel Frank is. Because, okay, yeah, that's be- an interesting thing. Because I think, I think it's spot on the way that you say that he represents order, because again, Frank is just the epitome of chaos. But the detective, Sandy's father, he does this thing and the way that he speaks to Jeffrey is that let's say that he symbolizes order and authority and that's the role that he plays. He has that very Lynchian way of doing things in which there is no barrier in front of him. Jeffrey comes to him and says, I found a severed ear. And he says, he opens it, he says, that's a severed ear. Let's go find out. With this strange directness about everything, that there's no secret, there is no secret to the father. And yet there's, you do feel as though there's something uncanny about the way that he approaches things. But the fact of the matter is, is that within this world, he is just being a very, very direct person. He just says things as they are. Whereas with Frank, that idea of like what you say, think of the confrontation that him and Jeffrey have where he's face to face with him as he rubs the lipstick on and whatnot. And he's saying, in dreams, I'm with you, I walk with you. I think I don't, again, it's Lynch, so I don't think that he's writing this down and approaching it as this represents this and this represents this. But it is just a very Jungian approach that the shadow of Frank still, no matter what, it's still so obtuse and opaque that there's so much more of an allure to Frank than there is of Sandy's father. It's also because Jeffrey hasn't fully integrated himself. He is a very naive character. He's finding out about those things in the first time and that's that's why right in the beginning when he's in the diner I'm seeing something that was always hidden I'm involved in a mystery I'm in the middle of a mystery he speaks in a way that he could also be speaking about himself right he's not necessarily always and only speaking about this underbelly of society. I also think that the detective is a very, very lynching character because the way he approaches something that is so absurd is almost like it's n- normal. Yes, that's a human ear, all right. It's a bit of a thought experiment because there's no definitive answer with the film. 
it feels as though the world of Blue Velvet is binary. I feel you have one side and the other. And there's the suggestion of, do they overlap one another? Is there any crossover or are they separate? The tonal shift in the film, as soon as Frank comes in, is so stark and strong. Because the first 40 minutes, I mean, I wish I was around when the film came out because I would like to know what people were... I would like to know the expectations of the film because I remember when I first saw it and I was aware of Frank as a character, but I didn't know exactly the intensity of it and it still caught me off guard. But I would like to know if people watched this film originally when it came out in the 80s, went to see it, and only 40, 45 minutes in, when Frank emerges, do they realise the kind of film that they're watching. But from Jeffrey's point of view, it, it makes sense that that beginning bit is really, really quite drawn out, and we're still, it's just this, it's very Twin Peaks as well, it's still just this strange, uncanny thing where we don't really quite know what's going on, and they act like children in school, but at the same, we don't know how old they are, and what I find interesting is that Jeffrey goes into the apartment and it's as though he literally enters another world and Lynch plays around with this you see it in Mulholland Drive you know when Dorothy's singing it's very similar to um, Silencio in Mulholland Drive he often uses these these blue and reds to signify the a, a, a almost dimensional shift in what's going on and I always say this with Lynch as well most of his films I feel that they're about his sound more than anything. I know you always say that. I, I in this one you can feel it in certain key moments as well. I mean, for me, it's yeah. because it might just be because I have a kinship with him with that. That this idea of you enter a place and there's just this droning sound that occurs. Or what Lynch does is that when we're in the apartment, there's no continuity within the sound that he uses. It's either outside of the apartment. There's a drone. Mm, which just continues all the way through. And then as soon as he's inside the apartment, there's no room tone. It's completely silent and it just emphasizes every detail. Cliche, but as you would hear things in a dream with the anticipation of something emerging. I think the ear is also key to that, you know, because it seems at first that the ear is a very random part of the body to choose as the first thing that Jeffrey will find. But in reality, once you cut the ear, I mean, that's obviously a direct uh, reference to Van Gogh and that's a point that he also says, stay alive, baby, do it for Van Gogh. Yeah. But besides that, it's also when you cut the ear, you essentially have a channel to, I mean, it's almost cre- it almost creates a symbolic channel straight to the head, like to the mind. Mm. You know, you have this loop. In the world of the mind... I mean, in the world of our subconscious, we don't necessarily know exactly what is good or bad. We have then the moral codes, the symbolic codes, the, I mean, the authoritative codes of the world, society and all that, that are going to integrate this idea of good and evil inside of us, right? Your neighbor. But what's your name, neighbor? Jeffrey. He's a good kid, Fred. Fuck up. That's why I think it's also strong that we know so much about Frank, but if you really think about it and observe it in the film, there's only two key scenes that we really get to know him. Yeah, I always, I always think that, and I've thought that ever since watching the film, Frank is this big, overwhelming shadow of the film, and when you watch it, like you say, he's in the film essentially twice in the end in that set. Yeah, and it's funny as well because when when we see him for the first time, we see him from Jeffrey's perspective in the closet. We, we see him from this like, in a voyeuristic way. I think he's playing around with the idea of what Freud called the primal scene or the scene in which the first time a kid watches their parents having sex or, and he doesn't really understand. And oftentimes what Freud would write is that the kid would hear it before seeing it which is interesting as well to go back to the analogy of the ear. Mm. And oftentimes because the kid is hearing it and not seeing it, he thinks that's a violent act that the father is imposing in the mother. And he has the idea of protecting the mother from that situation. But then we actually get to see the primal scene 
in that place, in that point, in that cave, like like even in a Jungian term, like in that cave, in that subconscious cave, that is that room. Even the darkness of it, even the, I mean, the closet is even like, although Jeffrey is not homosexual, the closet is a symbol of coming out into your sexuality in some form of another, you know? That's this di- dynamic of power of Frank and Dorothy calling each other, I mean, paternal and maternal names as well. And it's hard to pinpoint if she's enjoying or not, because at that point, it's so hard to figure it out if she is in a state of numbness or pleasure. And it's important that, because we see from Jeffrey's perspective, in that point, as a son-like figure that doesn't know how to pinpoint his mother's sexuality. Do it. No, stop it. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. Let's talk about Frank. Because if we want to talk about the relation between the paternal and maternal sex, even Dorothy's character, I think to set the foundation for that, you have to talk about Frank first because it all focuses around him. It's an unsettling performance from Dennis Hopper. He's so good in this. But I'm, that's me just, I'm downplaying it a lot because as we've said, he's only in the film for two and two sequences and the ending. But they're also very prolonged sequences and they are the most memorable moments of the film, no matter how you look at it. The thing about Frank is that, yeah, we can 100% look at his character and say, on a, on a Freudian perspective, a Jungian perspective, exactly what it is. And I think it's very valid to do that because, again, Lynch, when you know more about his work, you know that he doesn't like to overthink his idea. He's into transcendental meditation. And for him, that just means a case of going inwards and just feeling there's a very instinctual way of him creating his worlds and creating his people and the things that they do. And that's why very often, even though they may not make sense in the things that they do, you still get them. I think that it's valid to say, you know, Jeffrey's father uh, did the death of him in a way because he's not able to speak. But the idea of a moment, if you are, if you close your eyes and you imagine yourself in a dream and you imagine your inept father on the bed mumbling but not able to open his mouth, it's, it's such a powerful instinctual reaction that you have. And I think that applies with Frank. He is pure id but he's a character that evokes this level of disgust and unnerving in us in the manner in which he, in the way that he deals with Dorothy. He has this, he has an oral fixation that he likes things in his mouth. He likes speaking and role-playing as a baby. He's on top of this incredibly violent and drops things at the at the drop of a hat and everything he just devours everything around him that's the nature of him he when he's torturing jeffrey he puts on lipstick and kisses him he wants beer and he wants it now he's just for lack of a better term a giant toddler and we can delve deeper into this Mm -hmm. but also on the surface level he just reaches this innate disgust that we have for him as a character. And it's interesting because there's something about Frank that I think it's even now observing again and watching the film again is what makes him so fantastic as a character because it's so easy to make that and make it like that. It's too evil, too random, perhaps too chaotic that you don't have... It's, it's hard to find any humanity inside that character and then you would you brush it off because it wouldn't be as impactful. But the fact that we can recognize so many aspects of like dark humanity in it Mm. that's what makes it interesting a good example of that is when we are at ben's and he's listening to the song and he's like oh he's gonna cry and he's almost crying but he stops himself so what is that what does what does that show about him what does that show about frank see i'm going to go back and to that it's not what it shows it's how it's showing us you know, is how he's he's showing it. Because as you just said, Lynch is not everything is about this means this. This is like too low resolution symbolism. He's playing with like yes. higher, you know, he's playing with higher ideas. You can say, yeah, it means that he pr- probably has a trauma of something, that he's remembering something. But Lynch something. doesn't approach it like that. But he that. doesn't approach it like that, exactly, right? But it signalizes enough for you as the audience to think and see that he's not just this evil character there's something more to him and we don't need explanation for it we can infer we can create this um it creates this curiosity which is another central theme of the film is the curiosity 
the finding out about this underbelly. But there's a moment where Frank is in the car and he takes his psychotropic inhaler and he looks at Jeffrey and he says, you're like me. I think that the most obvious thing is that parallel between Jeffrey continuing what Frank is, but I think that it's I think that it's also deeper than that. I think that it's also a suggestion more so of the collective subconscious, of the collective darkness that we all are inevitably attracted to, but Jeffrey is the one that more than dipping his toe into it, he's actively being absorbed by it. And and I don't think that, you know, the sequences in which we see him actually start to hit Dorothy and whatnot, we see the motif of the candle lighting and and it keeps like looking like it's going to get blown out. Frank is always saying, now it's dark. I, I think that it's a very, you can look at it at a very surface level thing, but I think that there's a depth to how Lynch is approaching the nature of the shadow and our allure to it and how we can very easily very innocently finding ourselves completely swallowed by it. There is an acknowledgement within Jeffrey of something similar between him and Frank. Even if he denies that he likes it, he doesn't like it. After that, we see that he comes back to it again. And the time stops, like, that's a very important scene when he slaps. So it's not just because, it's not just Lynch being gratuitous and showing sexual violence. It's not that I think it signifies a shift in the character because he's going deeper. It's almost like he finds out that this evil in the world, this underbelly of darkness is also present within us if we cannot control it, right? Yeah. And more interesting than that, I think, is the fact that she calls him Don. Yeah, Dorothy calls Jeffrey Don. And at that point, particularly in that scene, Jeffrey is not sure entirely if Don is the husband that's been kidnapped or the son that has been kidnapped. Mm. So he infers that is the son after in the next scene. I find it very interesting because, again, it's playing with the idea of the Oedipus, um, the integration of it or disintegration of it, whatever you want to see it. I do think that Lynch is playing with that. Whether he, I don't think he sat down and saying, I'm going to create a film. I don't think he does that, but I think those things are there. He he 100% didn't do that. That's not how he operates. I know that Lynch, he never reveals his secrets and he always says, like, his films aren't meant to be understood and whatnot but i think it's the same with any art i get the idea that don't read too deep into it to say it's exactly this because again we're talking about it on a psychological level where again it's not an exact science but you can definitely infer things and you can read the patterns of what's occurring off topic i just always viewed i don't know if it means anything but i viewed that scene where uh, dorothy lights the candle And the way that the lighting shifts, it always just reminded me of a seance. Make of that what you will. Do you feel that? That's interesting. Yeah, I've I've always felt that. I think I think the way that he lights that scene, I mean, just the idea of lighting candle is very very like that. And then it becomes the the room becomes quiet. the The entire landscape of that scene always reminded me of a seance. Interesting. The way I see it is almost like time stops. Yeah. Like you know, and then after you can see that even heightened by the fact that he does puts everything in slow motion well here's something because lynch plays a lot I, I i mean just on the filmmaking of lynch as well because i'm I've, i'm always very interested in the way that he does things because a lot of the lynchian techniques that they don't even necessarily feel like transgressions of a technique say something like how kubrick would use zoom it would always be it would be a zoom but it would be much more extreme than you would anticipate it would be over a longer distance and very impactful but for me Lynch's techniques, they're not really tied to anything. I often think about things like the beginning of Mulholland Drive, where it's the dance scene and it's like green screened on like a... a, He uses purple, but it's a very strange, saturated tone of purple that you wouldn't associate with like a high art filmmaker. And he always does that. And the even the way he uses slow motion in this film, it's choppy. The way that he uses the way that he uses lighting all the time, it's so artificial on certain points. And and it, he really likes to 
you know, you, you're talking about how Sandy emerges from the darkness, and I don't think that it's a coincidence that at the end when they kiss that they're bathed in light, but he does it in a way that, you know, it just overexposes everything, he blows everything out, and I've always felt like he, it's not that he's unafraid to show artifice, it's just that it's a completely original way with looking at filmmaking in that, you know, okay, I know that I'm supposed to light the film this way, but it's why there's a certain B quality charm to one side of his filmmaking, and then he has another side of his filmmaking which emerges. And off, like in this, it's within the same film. And you say that when it when it feels like it's suspended in time inside of the apartment, it that it's at that point that his filmmaking changes within the film for how he tells the story as well. And it's not like it just like gradually emerges it's literally like a cut and then the entire tone and style of the film has changed jeffrey walks through the corridor and you can see that like he's lit almost like by a spotlight when he's in there and you mentioned that it's like time stands still it's interesting as well because at the end of the film the last time that they're in there it's almost as though time has literally stood still because there's a dead corpse and he's upright. Yeah, he's just hanging there, right? Yeah. yeah, and his brain is half out, which is something, like, very unnerving. Yeah. Like, you see bits of his brain out as well. I think that is... I, I think that that is a core aspect of the film, that wherever Jeffrey is at that point, it's a part of this world that he's in, but at the same time, it's somewhere completely other that's completely disconnected, and whatever goes on in that world is not going to shape the other world, but it's going to shape you as you start to continue your life in that. That's why I think in a way in a way or another, this is, has everything to do with being a coming of age. Even the individuation process of like becoming understanding your shadow and like traversing that. Because even in the end, the way that the detective after um we're gonna give a spoiler, right? Don't mind. After oh, yeah. after Jeffrey kills Frank, he's in the closet again. He kills Frank. He moves out of the closet and then the detective says something like like it's all over now, almost like like something that you say actually to a killer that just got arrested. You wouldn't necessarily say to someone that's a victim of the situation, like like Jeffrey is. It's a very odd line. It's it's out of place. It's all over, Jeffrey. It's very artificial. So it's almost like yeah, he traversed this whole thing. He's now integrated. He perhaps even repressed some of his id. He accepted the superego of society and the morality and everything. Say so he's integrated as a human being, he integrated his shadow. But there is still something unnerving about normalcy. There's still something fake about that world. Like you have like the the people waving and everything feels like so odd. It's almost as violent, you uh, know? Well well, here's what I think. I've always thought that, you know, whatever Lynch's canvas is and, and whatever world that he chooses it's it, it it's it's like a collage piece he takes the things that we recognize it's like okay we think of americana what do we think of that's why <laughs> that's why that we see the 1950 1950s cars the white picket fences you know teenagers we see a bit of everything but it's never just associated with one specific point in time it's all these things that in our memory that are there and they paint that picture but i think that he does the same with the with the other side, Frank's world. And I think that, you know, we're so willing to accept the the darkness of one side because we're able to suspend our disbelief and, and think that, you know, things can grow into this incredibly malevolent world. But when we see the other, maybe I don't know, maybe it's because we're just a bit more cynical. Because I do think that the idea of... I think both worlds are completely equivalent. They're both sides of the same coin as one another. I think I think the idea of Lynch using an artificial bird, I think it's just... I think it's the stylistic aspect. I think he's romanticizing the world in a way that is just part of an original thought. I think I think it would be stranger if the bird was real in that world. Then it really wouldn't fit. Yeah, I saw him outside. Maybe Robins were here. I don't see how they could do that. I could never eat a bug. 
Well, here's something, because, you know, we associate Lynch so often with nightmares and whatnot, but very rarely do I hear his work identified as part of the horror genre. Would you say that this is a horror film? (sighs) It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. It's not because it doesn't have horror elements to it. I mean, I'm, I'm the first person to defend the horror genre as one of the best ones to tackle psychological issues and like to play with the pastiche of darkness, humanity and all that and make it in a way that is very impactful and perhaps even easier to digest because you're like confronting things that you wouldn't in other, in other circumstances or they would be very odd and very dark and yeah. you're able to, by creating those monsters, you're able to tackle situations that you wouldn't in other films. So that in that case, I do see that in his work. But he was able to tra- he's, he's able to traverse the genre, like nothing bad to say about horror with that. I just think that he's in another camp, not better or worse. Just I think it's different. He was able to really create something that is. That's why we have the term lynching, I guess, because you can really you know, you really can contain him and like he has things that repeat throughout his filmography you have the curtains like you have the black and white floors you have like those weird times the way the sound works you have loads of things that repeat throughout his filmography but he has a very specific way of approaching things that I do not necessarily think I think horror will contain him in perhaps just like it's not enough to yeah. describe it but it's definitely flirts with horror mm. yes he flirts with it for sure what do you think I think something similar. I, I I think that I think that some of his films are horror films. I think that Inland Empire is a horror film in particular. Everything else, though, I'm not sure. Mm. Like Lost Highway, maybe, but again, it's because it's because tonally it's so unique to him. He he doesn't. There's in in this film like you have the horror of Frank that at the same time you can't help but find equally unsettling, equally comedic, equally enthralling at the same time, you know, when he takes Jeffrey out the car and then the woman gets on top and starts dancing. That's like a scene from a John Waters film. I See, I always think about John Waters, even when they're in Ben's house. I, I, you could have replaced that actor with John Waters and it would have been a great scene Be- as well. Because again, Lynch is still very... You know, we, we talk about the artificial bird and whatnot, but it's because a Lynch at the same time, he's still very kitsch. Look, yes. look throughout, like he made he made fucking what's it called? Um, Wild at Heart. After this, that is a film that's all about kitsch. But then again, kitsch is also works so much in the dream world in the sense of like, what is kitsch? I mean, the definition of kitsch is when you go to someone's house and then you have this like little uh, curtains that don't match the floor. Everything kind of like from different eras. We have this thrift store kind of look of things that just got borrowed from different times. And there's also a bit like the iconography of different, well, sorry, the iconography of different times is also the iconography of dreams because in a dream, you don't, you're not really in control. You're just playing with your memories. You play with your subconscious, subconscious and you have all those m- images and those symbolic messages that kind of blur in one. Yeah, because again- It's very kitsch. You're kind of playing at that point, like when you think of kitsch iconography, it's also very archetypical. Yeah. You know, like, and and Lynch Lynch's work really, really lends itself to that in the sense that, you know, he, he doesn't play with direct connotations, like, symbolically. Like we've said, he's not going to sit and write down that it means this or that. But at the same time, he plays with archetypes and whatnot. Like, like there's just, there's a scene where the first time just before they go into Dorothy's apartment and Jeffrey and Sandy are walking down the street and then someone just, like... It's as though Lynch looks at a lot of these extras in the film and then gives them like five minutes rehearsal and then says action. And then they do an action, which is like, honestly, it's almost like a Brisson kind of thing where the person will drive round the corner and to Sandy and yell, hey, baby, hey, and then carry on. And like, that's exactly what they were supposed to do. And it's so inhuman. You know, like Sandy's friends that she meets outside the school. And it's like they've had like 60 seconds to prepare for that scene. It's very made for TV. Yeah. And it feels like they are acting. And for, then Sandy yeah. walks up so much and they're like, oh, you look so cute. And then they look at him and say, he's hot. And <laughs> it, it's, it is, it, it's, 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 it's the mixture of Bresson and John Waters. 
And I think if in you could, horror, <laughs> if you if you could if you could bring the two together, I think that's what that's one of the Lynchian elements because again it can mean a number of things. That's the thing though. It's very hard to contain him and say this is what it means to be a Lynch to be David Lynch a Lynch in perspective right because yeah. when you think you figure it out his perspective he shifts it yeah yeah you know? yeah he makes straight story yeah just a, a man traveling America on his tractor and it's incredibly human and that's why I find this film so fascinating because it really when, when you understand Lynch's filmography as well you look back on this and and some people may be confused at first it's like okay fine whatever but why why is this like lit so weird why does this look like a made for tv movie why are people acting i get that they're uncanny but I, I, am i willing to suspend my disbelief for it but then when you watch his more grounded work say something like like the elephant man yeah like the elephant man yeah, and yeah. a straight story yeah. and where you see pe people dealing with drama he knows how to direct that he kno he knows how to bring forward humanism and even realism he can do that but it's just the it's the fact that in order to convey whatever message this film is it has to be this it has to be strange it has to look like a b movie and and it has to break the conventions of filmmaking so that whatever that instinctual gut feeling that Frank and the town of Lumberton need to convey, it's exactly that. His films, they really are. They're exactly what they need to be. I'm Paul, what's your name? Jeffrey. <laughs> Between Blue Velvet and Eraserhead, I think he's more obvious with his symbols and he matures his work more to the point that after you can feel that it's very, very, very um, modeled up and perhaps even abstract and he's able to integrate those ideas in a better way. But at the same time, I do, in terms of the sexuality present in his films, because after Mohan Drive and um, Alien Empire is a film that sex is very dark as well. Yeah. Very, very dark. But I don't feel... Perhaps I think it's because it's he approaches his work with such sincerity that it doesn't feel to me that he is trying too hard to shock you at all. Like, you know, I never feel in his films that he's trying to shock me. Oh, no, no. He's not trying to shock me. I don't even think that he's trying to transport transport me completely to a different realm. I think he wants us in this realm that we are, but kind of like floating, just, just a bit above it's not enough, you know? It's not a fantasy world. It's not a complete nightmare. It's always just a bit above. It's just in the limit, like, of strangeness enough that we can still see a lot of things that we recognize, but just be above enough that we can see things clearer. I, I think it's quite simple. I think in the same way that, you're t that you speak about the Robin that emerged at the end that's artificial... I think if we're willing to suspend our disbelief of a Lynchian world and how it looks and how society works and people speak with one another and we just accept it for what it is, how do we think that sex is going to be shown in these worlds? That it would fit within the mold of this world that he creates? It has to be the way it is. And I'm quite surprised that people are concerned that the film has sexual violence in it when that is what the film is speaking about. I, I think that people should have more of an issue with the idea of sex being shown as just this gratuitous not, not not even that just a, a very meaningless thing that just emerges fortuitously that doesn't mean anything I, th yeah. I, th I think that's even 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 if you don't relate it to anything bad i just think it's it, it would be a bit lazier compared to someone who even if they were willing to i don't know try and transgress sexual violence into something that they were trying to provoke What's the name of that film? Um, Irreversible. Is it Irreversible. Reversible? That's a film that I think uses sexual violence in a very gratuitous way that doesn't necessarily... I, I don't particularly... I'm keen on that film. It's 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 gratuitous. I've seen I've seen worse yes. implementations of it. I agree, I, yeah. I get what it's doing. I, I get it. I don't know if... I don't know if I like it because... It, my thing isn't even the famous rape scene yeah, of yeah. that that my issue with the film lies I think the gratuity for me actually emerges all around it it's the other stuff in the film yeah I get what you mean yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, they, like they show like sex 
like very very just yeah. openly and whatnot in the film i'm not bothered about it but it's just that i get what it's done, i get what you're doing like you're trying to paint a landscape that you know this is the kind of world that we're in and i get it but that's why you don't feel with lynch at all because he's able to show the corniness and the cheesiness and the like cookie cutter side of the world with the same respect yeah. that he gives to the dark underbelly he does he shows it with the same light it's almost like he's able to navigate those two worlds yeah very well like that you don't feel like the film is preaching to you what is good and bad no but it's just there the, those two things exist you know what i mean and make your make your own conclusions he's obviously not saying that frank is a good character but that's why i but, found that's why i found the uh jeffrey and sandy's story in this one resonated me resonated with me more than it has done at any other point because it it is actually approached with respect and i know that you can look at it and it looks like a hallmark greeting card but i think that it's very sincere it's it's as sincere as the shadow aspect yeah exactly right he he really shows it in a way that you don't feel like he's like tipping the the way he could easily do that in oh, yeah. this film and just focus absolutely more in the darkness of it but he does that's so much runtime for the story between sandy and jeffrey like that's a lot there of is, runtime there is. Yeah. it's the majority of the film yeah and it's a uh, it's quite sad and heartbreaking when in that scene when she comes into the house but it's that shadow world that in a way jeffrey has been protecting sandy from truly truly knowing so wait let me ask you something jeffrey goes to uh the bar first where dorothy's singing and the first time sandy's there with him and it seems as though he's going with very very innocent intentions and sandy is next to him and she has this reaction like she's watching jeffrey watch her yeah Mm. and there's kind of an unease on her face and she's very okay to go through with everything but in that scene in particular you sense that she doesn't really want to be there or she's kind of looking at Jeffrey thinking, you know, what's what's he thinking about the situation? And then the idea of later in the film, towards the end, where Dorothy is in the house naked and Jeffrey is holding her and it's in front of Sandy. What do you think that that signifies? What's the role of Sandy being present, being in the presence of Dorothy? I think... I'll rewind a bit, yeah, yeah, to answer the best way I can. From the beginning, from the get-go, I think Jeffrey's intentions at first are pure in the sense of like he is interested in the mystery, in the mystery of it. But then there is a level because he is unintegrated; he's f- finding out about his own shadow, and that's why I think that scene or the slap where the time stop is very important because. It's almost like Jeffrey recognizes himself in that world as well. Um, Because human sexuality is very complex. It's not an easy answer, right? And he he is, at some point in the film, I think he is enthralled sexually by that world as well. And I think that reality, which he tries to conceal away from Sandy, spills into their perfect Americana life in that scene in which not only Dorothy is representing perhaps like I mean the idea of the monstrous mother the 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 complicated relationship that that a boy could have with 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 this older motherly figure but also the shadow of his sexuality might as well be you know represented in that scene that's why she says like she forgives him but she says it was so hard for me to see that you know yeah she immediately forgives him for it. I loved you. God, I love you. I, I, but I couldn't watch that. I did just want to uh, mention as well, because that scene at Ben's house, I used to watch that scene quite often on its own. Because that might be one of the best scenes in general, in film. I think that sequence from when they ride up and you ask him what beer he drinks. I also I also wanted to speak about that, the Heineken theme that's in the film. I know, it's very funny. Because it, it comes across as a product placement. At first. At first, but then yes. he mentions Bud and he says, the king of beers. And I thought... 
I mean, it's not out of place in a Lynch film for characters to say that, but then Heineken just keeps emerging throughout of it, and then Frank chastises him for drinking Heineken. I think this is just Lynch playing with, again, the iconography of the world and just putting it in there, like, this is a person that drinks Heineken, and this is a person that drinks Pat's Blue Ribbon. I think that's how he does it. And he's also playing with film as well, film itself, like, as, as a commodity in America, in the sense of, like there is such a thing as product placement placement yeah, yeah. those made for tv yeah. films and he, he subverts that there's a um that. before i speak there's actually i wanted to mention this because there's also there's a game developer a japanese game developer called uh, sweary yeah mm. he's an auteur kind of but it, only in the way that uh he's an auteur because he essentially has no money and no one wants to fund his ridiculous projects I like them, okay. but um, you know it. So he made a game called Deadly Premonition, and it's the one where it has that really, really good theme music, and it starts with the guitar, and it's um. Yes. You know yeah, that one. Song, yeah, Life yeah. is beautiful. It's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that entire game is essentially his rendition of Twin Peaks as a game. Oh, is it? Yeah. That's interesting. And he made... His newest one was called The Good Life, in which he and his team went to the Cotswolds to... Ah, no, you... Were so, I remember you playing this game. To, yes. um... What's it called? They were, like, doing research and whatnot, so the entire game is, like, in the Cotswolds. And it's kind of, like... Not Deadly Premonition, but he had another one called Dark Dreams Don't Die, which we have, by the way. I've played it. But he approaches it... He approaches his games very Lynchian in the sense that most of the games are essentially characters talking about products that they know and they're real life products and they'll talk about tv shows and whatnot and when that conversation occurs of like heineken and bud and perhaps blue ribbon in blue velvet like a more in-depth conversation of that occurs in sweary's games I think you'd like them. I think you'd like them just to to see, like, it's this approach of, like, how Lynch approaches filmmaking of, like, it's completely unconventional and you're not supposed to do this. But it's also very sincere in a yeah, way. But it's also very them. Yeah, yeah. Like, that, that's it. what makes their thing individual. Sweary is like that in games. I remember watching you play this game that is placed on the cartoons. I remember because I remember thinking this dialogue is kind of funny yeah. like but there is like a quirkiness to it you know yeah, yeah i always whenever i think of blue velvet or anything like that i always think of silent hill as well and mm. i always think of the fact i haven't played silent, haven't hill, played yet, silent hill by the way i need to play silent hill because it's so me like it's such a game perfect perfect for me and one of the reasons that we're trying to avoid playing is because we don't have a, um the old console and the the remake of it changes the um, the way the characters speak they change the way the characters speak they changed um what oh yeah it's like um the the fog element they essentially got rid of yeah and all they, the things that remind me of lynch all yeah. the things that remind me of like this like weird like lynch and like nightmare universe yeah. that you show me of uh, silent hill that reminds me a little bit of lynch because in the sense of like when they change i think bits of the scenes that they change the dialogue and the way that the the voice actors speak in silent hill yeah and it always makes me think imagine if like even in a Bresson film as well like if the, it was acted differently. Yeah, it, it has would to change be like the that. Tone. It has to be like that. It's the whole thing about mood, because Lynch operates so much in mood. Like you can read this film almost like a traditional film noir of like normal characters finding out about the underbelly of society. Yeah, like you have all those cliches and all that, but it's not at all. It doesn't play at all like a film noir at the same time. It doesn't because it doesn't play like it doesn't play within genre, it doesn't play within horror. It's, exactly. it's just when you watch Lynch's work, it has to just be that even even like within his filmography, one film doesn't slot necessarily in with everything else. So he uses all that, he uses the product placement, the weird dialogues, the weird delivery, but he uses it in a way that is so him. It's I don't even think it's a case of like too bad that it's good, but because I think it's actually good. You know, I I think because it's not too bad that it's good because it it's um what's the term I'm looking for, it's 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 intentional, everything it's like it's like I've already said everything has to be exactly like this because it just it feeds this entire atmosphere it creates this whole milieu and this mood that carries on throughout the film, and then has to be severed when Frank enters and then changes then it has to be this, mm. but 
What's the name of the bar as well? The, this the, is it. This is it. No, I no, love that. No, that. no, that's when he goes to Ben's. Yeah, exactly. The, the, yeah. the Ben's place. Yeah, it just like says this is it on the window. And he keeps saying that he's suave. As well, I love that. Because it's such a weird word to come out of Frank's mouth. Well, here's something as well. Because there is, I don't care what anyone says, there's this strange homosexual relationship between Frank and Ben because Frank idolizes Ben as he's looking at him in a way that he doesn't do with it's it's like in the world of the film how did Frank and Ben meet because again there's a moment where like um Ben he carries that very very flamboyant edge with him as well with like his old school cigarette his glazed over eyes and yeah he's like he's above everything he's like in the clown yeah, like yeah, yeah. In, in, in atmosphere of his own he's still a great character he, he's kind of like um what would you what would you call it like, like a master of ceremonies isn't yeah, he yeah but at the same time you know there's a, there's a moment where uh ben takes frank over to one side and like he puts something in his mouth drugs whatever it is it doesn't really matter what it is but I think I think that you know like when Ben starts singing the song and Frank gets this this urge like this repressed thing within him again I'm not saying that that Lynch is coming forward saying oh this is about the repression of the homosexual tendency of Frank but whatever that feeling is it's the same feeling as when Frank is at Ben's Interesting yeah yeah I can I can see that yeah I wouldn't necessarily like say that's like a hundred percent on purpose, like we're saying with Lynch, we can yeah. always play around with like ambiguity because yeah. it could also just signalize the opposite. Almost like it could be a paternal figure, it could be someone that he respects, it could be this idea of someone that is able to be suave while Frank is not suave at all. Like Frank is the suave. opposite of the so he, perhaps he looks at him. There's a kinship, but almost like they went complete different different uh, ways in their personality. I don't. It could be homoerotic as well. I mean, he, I can see that a little bit. Yeah. He, he says, "Here's to Ben and everyone," and then he punches Jeffrey in the face <laughs> and says, "Be, be yeah, polite." Like, yeah, be polite. And then he says, "Here's to Ben." I like that, and and that's also the scene that we see the. I mean, we don't really see it, but we infer that Dorothy's kid is in that room. And that those all the women in there. This is something I love about Lynch. And he does this all the time. And this is just straight up Jungian psychoanalysis. This idea of the way that he films Ben's, aside from the couple of close-ups, it's like a 180 degree shot. It's just shot at the front and then shot at the back. And like we cut between, you know, all the women that are sat down there. And it's just, it, it's shot in a way that it's so flat and we just see it straight on and then we see the back and and it evokes this strange like back and forth between the space of the room but he always does stuff like this is that at the back of the room there's a door and the door opens and we peek in and something is going on in that back room and we have no idea what it is and this idea of like the these these locked away places within our own subconscious that we can't access and we know that there's so much going on inside of there and it really creates this this uncanny because it's a closed space that we see yeah. and we don't see the exit to the room itself the only door that we can actually see there is the one that we can't get into the one that we cannot see was behind we can but we can hear because when dorothy goes in he says something like mom mama still loves you mama loves you yeah. though and it, it's like a whole situation that we want to know what it is yeah and even because though, for honestly, all we know even, even the way that like we hear that scene of dorothy speaking again that is something that is how you would hear something in a dream because in a dream you, when you wake up you you kind of piece the things together and you remember the moments and i just remember you were in this room and you said mama still loves you like as, you know the scene doesn't necessarily play out as it would yeah and a lot of those characters that are there in the room they don't say anything they just, they just exist yeah there's a there's a mannequin at the back as well yeah you can miss that in really like if you're not paying attention you can see it you can almost see the real person as well i love I, I don't i love the fact that um all of a sudden because frank like he switches on a dime in everything that he does and i just love like he has to get up and he has he has to he always has to be doing something 
he has to be going and he has to be doing something so we're gonna go on a joyride i just love when he like he points to everyone and he says are you coming are you coming are you coming are you coming <laughs> he doesn't know and he's he because he's so aggressively confrontational but he's also very generous at that at that point there because he doesn't need to invite anyone and he does so it's like this weird dichotomy between it's almost like he, you can feel that he's more relaxed in ben's place oh yeah for some reason but i i love this idea of a person that's so incredibly you know aggressively <laughs> extroverted that they it's a complete a complete stranger they just point at you and say are you coming in our neighbor joyride let's get on with it bye ben anyone uh want to go on a joyride with us how about you huh well it's funny because this was the film that he made after dune not the dune that just came out the other dune which most people haven't seen and I don't blame them because it's it's neither a good Dune film nor a good Lynch film. It was a studio film and when Lynch agreed to direct it, he hadn't even read the book. Which is an odd thing, I think. But it was because, you know, um, it was Mel Brooks got him to direct The Elephant Man and then he had a deal that he was going to direct another film after and it was Dune. And I think it's I think the film's like a like hundred minutes or something like that. And then they had to cut loads of stuff. It was terrible. No one was happy with it. And it was from that point on because he didn't have a contract after the fact. And he was partnering with um, Dino De Laurentiis. He essentially made it a point that from this film on, all he was going to do was just was just create completely original work, no matter what it was going to be. And so this is really the first Lynchian film that we have. And it's quite... Because you can see like seeds of it in the previous work, like you can discard Dune because it doesn't really matter. But you can see from here onwards how his language really emerged just out of the blue. And I always think that he was brave enough to be able to make a film that, okay, I'm going to create this this strange surrealist Americana, almost like a high school drama, and I'm going to stick to that. And then I'm going to sever all connections to that world and take the audience to this living nightmare the likes of which they've never seen before this is it Raymond we hope you all enjoyed this episode on Blue Velvet thank you all for listening if you want to hear more deep dives go over to the podcast the podcast I hate this I hate signing off go over to the Patreon at patreon.com slash cinemacartography where you can watch all our stuff it's all as good as this or as bad as this however good or bad you thought this was thank you all for listening we'll see you all next time hi everyone welcome to deep dive sorry should i say hi no you don't have to okay you can if you want whatever i'll say hi too just hi yeah okay (laughs) <laughs> hi everyone hi <laughs> that's so awkward <laughs> just do it no whatever okay hi everyone hi everyone <laughs> welcome to deep dive <laughs> <laughs> we are on camera so if you want to support this project <sighs> start again so, okay so points Hi everyone, this is us. We work on this pro. No, sorry. Hi everyone, this is us. It's hard. Can can I try? I'm gonna try just so we can you can hear it. I'm not saying that you can use mine. I just wanna try so you can hear it. Okay. You can try, but I've already got in my head like what I need to get across. Just so we can try. It might be shit. Go for it. Hi everyone, and welcome to the deep dive. Hello. We are on camera. I mean, we haven't been on camera ever. I think in this. uh, in this channel, right? What are you talking about? We just recorded a whole episode. Mm. So what the <laughs> shit? Mm, mm. What you you don't do that? You only do that when you feel awkward in front of camera. <laughs> just put all that like in the beginning. Listen, of the time. Here, here's how it's done. Here's how a spot's done. Hi everyone. Are you just waving? The cinema cato- uh, cartography. <laughs> the cinema cartography has always just been us two. I don't even know why you're laughing. I'm going to get through this spot. Do it again. The cin- no. The cinema cartography has always... 
but we've decided to bring it public for the main channel. Now, my cunt is blue, and because of that, I have serious medical issues, and I have to see a doctor regularly. Don't overthink it. Because I've got a joke in my head. Oh, no, which joke? I can't say. I definitely can't say it. It's in my head. Let me try. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the deep dive. In the deep dive, we talk for about an hour. <laughs> that was shit. fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> we talked for about an hour. <laughs> there was a point that you also set up about talking. I just remember he said that. No, I tried to say it too. <laughs> we talked talk for about an hour. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> okay, hell. I'm a web. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to the deep dive. <laughs> I still like this. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, go funny. on. Go on. Are you doing it? No, I'm gonna just say hi everyone and welcome to the deep dive and then you're gonna pick it up from there. No, no, no way. No way. No way. <laughs> go on then. Hi everyone and welcome to the deep dive where we talk in depth and in a completely uncensored and uncut way. It's not uncut really, isn't it? <laughs> In a completely uncircumcised way. That's why the joke was in my head. How was it? <laughs> I was saying like, <laughs> we're uncut. I couldn't get it out of my head. Oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Hi, every- Were you going to do it? Oh no, I was just breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, maybe you can do it. Hi everyone, and welcome to Deep Dive. <laughs> We've been trying to do this spot for about an hour. Hold <laughs> well on. Is it gonna go off when it finishes to do is, it? The thing is, is that this is so not us. I know it's not, it's but that's not what I'm us. saying. Just do we not, have to introduce? Yeah, yeah, we have to a little bit to get. Like, Just for this one, we're not doing that again. Fuck no. Jesus but we're doing Christ. the one minute bit. Yeah, yeah. So. Do you want you take over one bit? I take over one other bit. No. No. Hi everyone, and welcome to Deep Dive. Deep Dive is a show. Where we talk <laughs> <to one more. laughs> it's a show where we talk for about an hour. <laughs> Imagine like Cisco and Eva opening with that. <laughs> yeah, it's a show where we talk for about <laughs> The thing is, it's hard for introducing yourself, oh. isn't it? It's just so weird. Because it, it's just so shit and, and it's Can clonic. we just do a voiceover? Just. Can we just do a voiceover? We can write it. No, because it's just gonna. It's, like, we need to like, introduce ourselves a little bit. Okay. <laughs> 